Good morning. A very uh, good morning to you all uh, this morning. It's great to be uh, together in the house of the Lord. You know, this is the best way to start the week, the right way to start the week, to be in the house of the Lord with the saints worshipping the living God. And I want to read to you uh, at the beginning of our service this morning from Psalm 34. Psalm 34. It's a psalm of praise. It's a psalm that talks about God as our deliverer, the God who delivers us from all of our fears, the God who is with us in all of our troubles. And, you know, there's a lot of fear in the world, a lot of trouble in the world, but knowing the Lord in the midst of life's fears and troubles makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. And here in Psalm 34, we read these words. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him, and he delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together. Father, it's with joy and anticipation that we come together this morning as we gather here in your presence to meet with the living God. We pray, Lord, this morning that you would meet with us, that you would speak to us, that you would minister and strengthen and encourage, that you would bring comfort and peace where it is needed. That you would, Lord, bring joy and hope. And Lord, as we worship you this morning, may our praise be in spirit and truth. And Lord, we ask that as we gather around your word together, that you would speak words of life to us. And that as we leave this place a little later on, we would do so better off having met with the living God. And so this morning, Lord, we commit this time to you. We pray that you would be pleased to be amongst us, that you would be praised. We ask these things in Jesus' wonderful and mighty name. Amen. 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 Let us stand together and let's worship the Lord. Thank you.
together. Amen. Let's continue worship. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. 
Father, what a blessing it is just to be able to sing the beautiful words of these songs, to praise the living God for all that you have done, the great song of salvation, the song of redemption, that we would be able this morning to rejoice and to give thanks because Jesus Christ came into this world, died upon Calvary's cross, rose again on the third day, and he purchased our redemption. He provided the forgiveness of our sins, and he gave to us a future and a hope. He gave us that hope of eternal life for which this morning we are grateful. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please do be seated. We are coming uh, before the table of the Lord this morning. I just invite you to um, take a moment to prepare your hearts to partake of the bread and the wine. I'm reminded this morning of the time in ancient Israel when they celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The people of Israel would sweep clean their homes. They would sweep clean every corner, every nut and cranny, to remove any trace of leaven that might be found within their home in order to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because, you see, the leaven represented the sin of Egypt. And God had delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. And having come out of Egypt, there was now to be found in them no trace of Egypt. God brought them out of Egypt, and Egypt was to be removed from them. And so they would sweep clean their homes No leaven was to be found, and they were to partake of the feast of unleavened bread. Well, about this very thing, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and he said this, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but let us keep the feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And this morning, in the words of Paul, I invite you to examine yourselves, and so let a man eat of the bread, and drink of the cup. And so let us take a moment this morning in the quietness of this place to bow our heads, to examine ourselves, to confess our sins, and to partake of these emblems in a worthy manner. Take a moment, please. Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. 
And he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. This table speaks of life. Not temporal life, but eternal life. Life in all its fullness, abundant life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And we can know this morning, each and every one of us here can know eternal life in his name. This is the great hope of the gospel. And it's because of the cross of Calvary that this is made possible. And this morning, in obedience to the Lord, we are called to partake of these emblems in an act of thanksgiving, in an act of remembrance, and indeed, in an act of proclamation. If the servers would please come forward. Paul said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance. Please do take a piece of bread and hold it on your lap and we'll partake together in a moment. The body of Christ broken for you, take eat. In the same manner, he also took the cup. After supper, say, in this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
This is the new covenant in my blood. Let us drink together. Father, it's with thanksgiving within our hearts that we partake of these emblems this morning. As we look back and remember the great sacrifice that was made, that Christ died in our place, that he died that we might live. And we're thankful for this wonderful gift of forgiveness of sins and eternal life that you have given to us. But this morning we don't only remember and we don't only give thanks, but we also proclaim. We proclaim the victory and we proclaim the triumph that was accomplished on Calvary's cross where our Lord and Savior defeated the power of sin and death. And through the message of the gospel today, we proclaim his victory. We proclaim his victory as the message of life and hope in this world today. We thank you and we praise you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let us um, stand together and continue to worship the Lord. Thank you.
Lord, what a glorious day we have to look forward to, Lord Jesus, when you come, when you reign again on this earth, Lord. We just thank you. We love you. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, once again, good morning to you all. It's lovely to be together. And you know, there's something unique about the church, something very unique about the people of God, that we are able to come together week on week like this to worship the Lord and to rejoice in what He has done. You know, the joy of the Lord is indeed our strength. The joy of the Lord is, is transcendent above all the circumstances of life. The circumstances of life will never be able to rob you of the joy of the Lord because it's a quality of the spirit, not just a quality of the emotions. And we can know that joy. And you know, this morning as we were just singing and worshiping the Lord, I sensed the pleasure of the Lord as we are just rejoicing in his goodness today. Okay, a few announcements uh, for this coming week. Um, just a few notices. Little Lights um, will be meeting this Tuesday morning at 9.30 and also the coffee morning at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. The home groups are happening as normal. Wednesday home group is meeting on Zoom. And the Thursday home groups A and B will be meeting also. Please see your home group leaders um, to confirm the venues uh, this week. If you're not in a home group but you'd like to join uh, the home groups or one of the home groups, please do uh, let us know. Um, we'd love um, for you to join. Um, on Friday, there is the youth bowling evening, a youth bowling evening this Friday, 7 o'clock for the young people. If you'd like to go along, please see Jim and Victoria um, after uh, the service. Okay, um, just a few other things coming up. Um, on Saturday, the 25th, 5th of February, uh, Mercy will be having, of course, the baby shower. We've been announcing it the last few weeks. Encourage all the women to come along and celebrate um, the birth of Mercy's new baby on the 25th of February. On the 24th of February, that's the day before, on Friday the 24th of February, there will be a ladies' prayer meeting um, followed by a fellowship lunch here in the church. Um, all are welcome. Um, please see Pat for details. I believe it's 11.45, Pat. 11.45. 11.45 on Friday, the 24th of Feb, a ladies' prayer meeting followed by a fellowship lunch. Um, please make a note of that. If you can, all are welcome. Um, we'll also be kicking off um, a series of men's and women's ministry events um, running throughout the year that we'll be announcing um, over the coming uh, days. Okay, um, the children uh, can leave us, but let's pray for them before they go um, and ask the Lord to bless them. Father... We do thank you, Lord, for each and every child that we have here in this church, and we do pray that you would bless them, that you would establish the foundation of the gospel within their hearts, that they may grow up to love and to know the Lord Jesus Christ for themselves. And Lord, this morning as they go to Sunday school, we do pray that you would just bless all of our teachers and helpers, and that they would be able just to impart something of your goodness and righteousness and the glorious truth of your word into our children today. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, the children are able to leave us right now. There's a new um, Connect card that I'll let Steve tell you about, because I don't know too much about it. But there's a new Connect card um, for all those who are, are new. And we know we've had a, new, a few new faces recently, and we'd love to um, get to know you a bit better. And so um, Steve will tell you a little bit more about that. But um, Steve's going to come now and just uh, bring the word of the Lord to us this morning. Thank you, Steve. Yes, thank you, Philip, and good morning to you all. It's uh, lovely uh, to see you all today. Uh, yes, if, if you uh, have joined us in recent weeks and months, um, if you check out your bulletins, um, and there are some paper ones out there if you didn't pick one on, uh, pick one up earlier, 
Um, there is a little QR code there and an online form um, if you want to uh, go there and you can provide us with your contact details and sign up for the church email contact list. And uh, we have a church app called Church Suite, which we use for uh, the church directory and event signups and uh, rotors and all that kind of thing. Uh, and so um, uh, have a look at the bulletin and uh, that will give you the information you need. And uh, if you want to fill in one of those forms, uh, we can get you all connected with those things. Uh, okay. Um, well, if you've got your Bible with you, please open up, uh, first of all, to the book of Colossians chapter 3, but we're also this morning going to be in the book of Genesis, chapters 1 and 2. Now, we are continuing our study through Paul's letter to the Colossians uh, this morning, uh, we are in Colossians chapter 3, a very practical chapter, all about practical Christian living, all about how we can live uh, a life that is like Christ, that brings glory uh, to God. And uh, we are in a section of chapter 3, beginning in verse 18, in which the Apostle Paul addresses three specific relationships and gives instructions to us concerning uh, these three uh, relationships and how we are to conduct ourselves in those uh, relationships uh, in order for uh, our good and for God's glory. Uh, the three relationships spoken of in the section are the marriage relationship, the relationship between husbands and wives, the family relationship, that between parents and children, uh, and the relationship which we would say today uh, between uh, employers, employees in the workplace. Uh, now, last week we introduced this section with something of an overview of the section, particularly uh, paying attention to an underlying principle uh, that runs throughout these instructions regarding these three relationships, and that was the principle of authority and submission, uh, a principle uh, established and ordained by God for the orderly function of his creation. Now, this week, we are going to begin to look at the first relationship uh, that Paul addresses here, and that is the marriage relationship in verses 18 and 19. And so I'm just going to begin by reading uh, these two verses, uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Wives... Submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word today. We pray your blessing upon our time together. By your spirit, may you encourage us. Uh, may you instruct us, Lord, concerning uh, this marriage relationship that you have created and ordained. And so, Father, we uh, commit our time to you now as we ask for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, it really wasn't that long ago uh, that if you stood up in the public square and made the statement that marriage is the relationship between one man and one woman nobody would have batted an eyelid. Uh, yet today, if you made that same statement in the public square, not only would you likely be on the receiving end of a torrent of abuse, you may well be reported to your employer and you could even face the sack. You may get a visit from the police who may want to question you. Now, all of that has changed quite dramatically in the space of, of the last 10 years. Uh, back in 2014, uh, the government uh, passed a law changing the legal definition of marriage to include same-sex couples. Uh, the biological reality of male and female was no longer relevant to the institution of marriage. Uh, and since then, we have found ourselves at a time where the biological reality of male and female itself is now under question. Uh, one of the primary 
um, questions that is uh, all over the place in our culture today is the question, what is a woman? And politicians left and right have been falling over themselves to avoid answering the question. Uh, even giving some, you know, almost scarcely believable answers. Uh, we have seen recently uh, in Scotland uh, the attempt to pass uh, a Gender Recognition Act uh, allowing people to self-identify as male or female uh, however they see fit. The UK government uh, blocked that legislation, at least for now. Uh, and the First Minister of Scotland has got herself in all sorts of problems because of a male prisoner who identified as female being put in a female prison even though he was being jailed for raping women. And, of course, uh, that then was uh, challenged and uh, the Scottish government backed down and the prisoner was put in a male prison and the First Minister of Scotland has been tying herself in knots in trying to explain uh, how that all makes sense. Uh, this past week, our Prime Minister, the UK Prime Minister, gave an interview to Piers Morgan <coughs> and one of the questions that Piers Morgan asked him was... What is a woman? Uh, the, the Prime Minister gave something of a, of a chuckle, uh, but he gave the answer, a woman is an adult human female. And indeed, that is the correct answer. But you see, we are living in a world today where not only is the nature of marriage under attack, but the very notion of what it means to be a man and a woman is under attack. And so it is vitally important that we as Christians have a thoroughly biblical perspective on marriage and underlying that is a biblical perspective and understanding of male and female, of men and women. And so as we are here in Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 18 and 19, which deals with the marriage relationship, I thought uh, it would be good, particularly in the, con uh, the, the cultural context that we find ourselves in, uh, to uh, this morning take some time just to establish the basic biblical foundation for marriage as the relationship between one man and one woman in a lifelong faithful union. And we can do that because God has given us the basis for that in the scriptures. And we find it in the book of Genesis, chapters 1 and 2. And so please uh, turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Now, one thing I find very interesting about the current cultural context uh, is that this whole um, situation over what is a woman and, and the differences between men uh, and women um, is creating a, a, a large storm in the culture, uh, not because Christians are, are doing anything. Um, plenty of non-Christians are recognizing the problems uh, and are speaking out against these things. Uh, but I would suggest that only uh, Christians have a true foundation for understanding what a man and a woman is. Uh, and we have uh, the true basis for understanding uh, men, women, and the distinction between the two, uh, because marriage and male and female are, are both God's creation and are part of God's created order. Uh, and that is what we see established here in the beginning in the book of Genesis. Now, uh, the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. The word Genesis comes from the first few words in the beginning of the book. Uh, and of course, the book of Genesis explains the beginning of a great many things. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, and then from there, we have the land and the seas and the skies and the stars in the skies and the sun and the moon and the birds and the fish and the animals 
and indeed man and woman. And the picture that is presented to us um, at the beginning of the book of Genesis in the first two chapters, uh, after God had created, is that of a perfect world, a paradise in Eden, a picture of the way things were, the way things are supposed to be, and indeed the way things will be in the future. And at the very heart of the creation account is God's creation of Adam and Eve, of man and woman, of humanity. And Adam was created first. And Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden, and Adam was given work to do, and he was given responsibilities to keep. And everything in God's creation was good, except one thing uh, remained incomplete, uh, and that was the fact that Adam was alone. And it wasn't that Adam complained about being alone, it was that God looked upon Adam and said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And in Genesis uh, chapter 2, we are told that God told Adam that he would provide for him a helper. And indeed, in chapter 2, verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And so now with man and woman, truly God's creation was complete and indeed was very good. And so from the beginning, we see that God created man and woman. He created male and female. Uh, And in the first two chapters of the book of Genesis, we learn a lot about this man and woman. We learn about how man and woman are the same. We learn about how they are different. And we learn about how they were made for each other as a complementary pair. And so if we are to think rightly about marriage, we need to think rightly about male and female. Uh, And to do that, we need to understand God's purpose and design in his creation. And with a solid foundation uh, of the book of Genesis, everything else then that the Bible says about male and female begins to make much more sense when it's put in the proper context of God's created order. Uh, And so what I want to do um, this morning is just take a brief survey through chapters 1 and 2 and into chapter 3 of the book of Genesis, uh, just to see what the creation story tells us about men and women. Uh, And I'm going to make a number of points. Some of them will go quite quickly, and so if you're taking notes, you might want to get your pens at the ready. Uh, But the first thing to note is in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. And that is, both man and woman were created in the image of God. Genesis 1 verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, God created many things uh, on the six days of creation. Uh, Indeed, he created many living things. Uh, But men and women are unique and distinct among all of God's creation because men and women alone bear the image of God himself. Uh, And because both men and women bear God's image... Both men and women stand equal before God, equal in value to God, equal in dignity before God. Both man and woman were created in the image of God. Second point, 
here in Genesis 1.27, is notice that man, in this verse, has both singularity and plurality. Let me read it to you again. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, the Hebrew word for man here is Adam. And in the creation account, Adam is used to refer both to Adam, the man in particular, uh, but also to humanity in general. Uh, And we see this here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, where the context is humanity in general. And we see in this verse that humanity in general can be named in the singular, man, Adam, but at the same time it can also be uh, named in the plural, as male and female. And that distinction is important because what it means is that firstly there is one humanity. There is one humanity created by God. But that one singular humanity consists of two biological sexes. Within that one humanity of God's creation, there are two. There are male and female. Now, the third point we see is in verse 28 of chapter 1. And that is that the man and the woman were both given joint rule over God's creation. Take a look at verse 28. Then God blessed them, that is the man and the woman, and God said to them, to both of them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so here we have uh, this command given by God jointly to the man and the woman. And they are told, in essence, to do two things together. They are to firstly fill the earth by being fruitful and multiplying. And then secondly, they are to subdue the earth and exercise dominion over it. And the man and the woman were told to do these things together with God's blessing. Indeed, they could not do these things individually on their own. The man and the woman need each other in order to fulfill God's creative purpose. That brings us to the fourth point, that within this joint rule, The man and woman were given different tasks, and they were created in different realms. Now, this is where the distinction begins to come into play. And and there's lots here we we could unpack, but I'm going to try and keep it brief. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, uh, this is before Eve was created out of Adam, We read that the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Now, what's interesting there is that Adam was created outside of the Garden of Eden. He was created from the dust of the ground and was placed in the Garden of Eden by God. And he was given the task by God of tending and keeping the garden, which was to be his home, his dwelling place. That is to say, he was to protect, and he was to cultivate it, really for the benefit of all who would dwell therein. That was Adam. Eve, on the other hand, we read in verses 21 and 22, a passage we read a few moments ago, Eve was created inside of the Garden of Eden, and she was created out of Adam. 
Now, the creation mandate that was given in uh, verse 28 of chapter 1, remember, was twofold. Uh, fill the earth, be fruitful and multiply, and, and subdue the earth, exercising dominion over it. And both of those commands were jointly given uh, to the man and the woman. Both of them were required if they were to fulfill this creation mandate. Uh, but each, uh, each of them, the man and the woman, were uniquely fitted for uh, one or the other task. Uh, Adam was created with greater natural physical strength, and that makes sense uh, when you think of the job that he was uh, given by God to do, and that was a physical job to till the ground, to be the worker, to be the protector. Indeed, interestingly, Adam was created out of the dust of the earth, the very earth that he was to till and to cultivate. Uh, Eve, on the other hand, uh, and this is one of the most amazing things in the whole creation story, if you ask me, Eve was created with the capacity to cultivate new life within her body. And so she was created, uh, fitted especially for this uh, task of filling the earth and being able to be fruitful and multiply. Indeed, interestingly, Eve was created out of human life, out of Adam, the very human life she would subsequently cultivate within her womb. But you see, in both of these things, both Adam and Eve needed the help of the other in order to accomplish the mandate. Eve needed Adam's help. She couldn't conceive and bear a child on her own. She needed Adam. Uh, but Adam also needed Eve's help as well if he was to fulfill his obligations as well. And so we see this joint creation mandate given to both of them. But at the same time, we see that there are some specific distinct purposes that God had for both the man and the woman. Now, another thing to note in this passage is in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 2. Uh, again, before Eve was created, and that is that the man Adam was given responsibility by God for uh, the holiness of the Garden of Eden. Take a look at verses 16 and 17. Uh, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying... Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Uh, and so here we see the man was given the task uh, not only of working the garden to tend and to keep it, but he was also given the responsibility for ensuring that God's commands were kept, that holiness in the garden was maintained. There was a spiritual responsibility that God gave to the man in the garden. If he failed to fulfill that responsibility, that would bring forth death. And thus the responsibility that God gave to the man here is a very serious one. Now, the next point, and we've already referenced it, but we need to, to make it again, is that the woman was given as a helper to the man. Take a look at verse 18. And the Lord, said, Lord God said, it is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground of the Lord God... Uh, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the air and to the beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And for that reason, it was the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. 
Uh, and so Eve then was created out of Adam. Now, one thing that tells us is that both Adam and Eve, man and woman, are made of the same stuff. Um, and, and, and in the sense, we see once again the equality of man and woman uh, before uh, God. But we see also then in these verses uh, that uh, Eve was created for Adam. She was created from Adam, speaking of her equality with Adam, but she was created for Adam, speaking of a difference in function. Uh, and so Adam then was given, if you will, the, the leadership role, responsibility uh, for um, working the ground, responsibility for protection, responsibility uh, for maintaining holiness in the garden, the responsibility to name uh, the animals. And Eve was created to come alongside Adam so that together they could fulfill God's will and purpose. Eve was created to be Adam's helper. Now, it's important to note that the word helper here does not in any way imply any kind of inferiority. Uh, indeed, many times in the Old Testament, we read that God himself comes to help uh, his people. God is our helper. Uh, and so, in, in, in that sense, just as God would come alongside his people to help them fulfill his will and purpose, uh, so too here, God creates Eve and brings her alongside her husband, Adam, to help him so that together they could fulfill uh, the creation mandate that he had given them. And so, there is a recognition then that Adam could not do it on his own. Adam needed the help of the woman. He needed the help of his wife because there were things that Adam could not do by himself. And so, Adam not being able to fulfill the creation mandate of taking dominion over the earth without the woman is brought the woman to make him complete and to enable him, together with his wife, to fulfill God's purpose. Now, Another interesting point to note is in verse 23. Uh, and that is that the names man and woman, the words man and woman, uh, themselves suggest uh, an interdependence between the two. Uh, notice um, after God brought Eve to Adam, verse 23, Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, the Hebrew words used there for woman and man are related. There is isha and there is ish. Uh, and um, it is also the same, kind of quite remarkably in some ways, in the English language. We have woman and man. Now, one of the interesting things that has been happening in recent years um, with this uh, particular uh, attack on biological sex is this, there's been some really strange attempts in order to, to, to re, um, reconfigure the word woman in order to remove man. You may have seen the W-O-M-X-N spelling that the kind of people have given an option on, on things or W-O-M-Y-N. And, and there's some, some really kind of, you know, the lengths that some people will go to to try and, um, you know, kind of just break up the, the, the connection, really, between man and woman is remarkable. Uh, but we see here uh, in our language that the connection between man and woman is very clear in our language itself, as it was in uh, the Hebrew language. 
Uh, and again, this connection and this interdependence is expressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, when the Apostle Paul said, Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. And so there is an interdependence there. Uh, Adam needed Eve, and Eve needed Adam. And uh, we see that interdependence, which is important. Um, now, th then, then what happens? Well, verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so here we have the establishment of the nature of marriage. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, of course, interestingly, neither Adam nor Eve had a mother and father. They were created directly uh, from God. But, of course, they would become mother and father to a great many uh, children, and indeed to all of humanity in that sense. Um, but... They both came, and then here's kind of the, the really important point. Adam and Eve both came from one flesh. God created Adam, one flesh, and he created Eve out of Adam. They both came from one flesh. Now here, they become one flesh. They are joined together. The two become one. And so man and woman are sort of made of the same stuff, if you will. Uh, but they are meant for each other. And this is fundamentally why marriage is and must be and can only be the union of one man and one woman. Because marriage is not just the union of two persons, but it is the reunion of a complementary pair that God has created. They were both created out of one flesh, and in marriage they become reunited as one flesh. And so fundamentally, marriage can only be a relationship between one man and one woman, because only that relationship has the ability to become a one flesh union because it is only man and woman that came from one flesh to begin with. Now, last couple of points as we wrap up here. Um, we see in the passage then that um, the man uh, and the woman both experience the effects of the curse after the fall in chapter 3. The end of chapter 2, we read that they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. But then in chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, uh, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, uh, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Now, here we see uh, a dramatic change, a dramatic shift. Uh, as sin uh, enters the world, Eve is deceived and falls into sin, uh, acting independently of her husband, while we also see that Adam abandons his responsibility that God has given him to protect the holiness in the garden as well. He stood by while Eve 
sinned, and then not only that, he followed her into sin. And more than that, later on in verse 12, he will have uh, the temerity to then blame God for the whole thing. Well, God, actually, it's your fault, really, because you gave me the woman and she did it. So it was nothing to do with me. He was the first man to shirk his responsibility. He certainly wasn't the last. But you see, Adam's sin was not only disobeying God's command, but it was also throwing off his responsibility as the spiritual head. He followed after Eve rather than following God's word. And in the end, we see both are punished, really, for their disobedience. Uh, and, and each of the, the sort of the punishments was related to the specific tasks that God had uh, given them, the unique tasks. For the man, in his unique domain, which was sort of work in the ground, the ground would be cursed. So now on, the ground, uh, tilling the ground would be hard work, and it would be by the threat, sweat of his brow, and there would be thorns and thistles and all these kinds of things. The, the, the ground would still yield its crop and provide food, but it was now going to be hard work. Uh, for the woman, in her unique domain in, in childbearing, um, that will also bear the effects of the curse. Uh, the miracle of life and birth will still take place, uh, and wonderfully so, because it would be through that that, that the Messiah and the Savior would come and the promise would uh, soon follow. Uh, but that childbearing would now be accompanied by pain. Um, and um, those ladies that have gone through that experience uh, will know all about it. Now, it makes you think, um, you know, what, what if the fall didn't happen and Eve had kids before, uh, before that? I mean, it just would have popped out, you know? <laughs> no, no, no problem, no going into labor, no none of that, you know? Uh, but anyway, it never happened, so, 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 so we don't know. But, but we see then now there's going to be some frustrations. There's going to be some sort of anguish. There, there's now uh, pain. There's now uh, anguish. There's now labor and these kinds of things. And finally, um, we see that in the curse, after the fall, the relational wholeness and oneness between man and woman is ruptured. And, and you see, uh, beginning in verse uh, 16, after the Lord um, uh, speaks the curse upon the, the, the serpent, and indeed gives the promise of the coming Messiah in verse 15, uh, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. You shall desire, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now the word desire there, it's not speaking of a romantic desire. He's not saying, oh, you will have romantic desire for your husband and everything will be great. Uh, no, on the contrary, the word desire, it carries the idea of mastery. Um, it's the same word used in the next chapter, in, in verse 7 uh, of Cain. Uh, the Lord said, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. You see, sin was desiring to, to master and overtake and domineer uh, Cain. Uh, and the same sense is here that as part of the curse, uh, Eve, uh, the woman, would desire to have mastery over her husband. Uh, and then, verse 17, he said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I have commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, thorns and sisals and so on uh, and so forth. But you see now there is where there was a one flesh union and perfection between man and the woman, now there is a conflict. The man wants to be in charge and the woman wants to be in charge. So two separate individuals now beginning to butt heads. Um, and that is something we see and often experience and, and have done throughout all of human history uh, since uh, the uh, fall. And this is why God has a wonderful purpose in marriage and why the relationship in the New Testament between husband and wife is painted for us uh, and um, explained to us in the context of the relationship between Christ and his church. Because the call for the husband is not to domineer his wife, uh, but to lovingly, sacrificially lay down his life for the good of his wife. 
uh, and the calling of God uh, to, to the wife is not to domineer over her husband, uh, but to, to accept and receive his loving, sacrificial uh, love and service uh, and leadership by, by respecting and submitting herself to him. Now, this is what we will get into next week because uh, there, there's a lot of things to tease out with this and there's a lot of uh, misunderstandings uh, and a lot of people get hot under the collar when we talk about these things. Uh, but the picture of marriage is a wonderful picture of a, a, l- a loving wife um, uh, submitting and respecting uh, a husband who lays down his life sacri- self-sacrificially uh, for her good. And, um, and anything else that gets in the way, the, the, the conflict and the, the domineering and the desire to, to dominate, uh, in, in the worst extreme cases, you know, abuse and coercion and those kinds of things, all of those are a result of the fall. All of those are perversions of God's created order. And it's important that we are able to distinguish between what is a perversion of God's created order and what is an expression of God's created order. Uh, and that is what we will begin to unpack then and bring all these kind of the, these foundational principles into uh, the real world of today and the marriage relationship, uh, which we'll do next week. Uh, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. We pray uh, that you will bless uh, your word to the good of all of our hearts. Lord, help us to uh, understand uh, your wonderful and good purpose for men, for women and particularly for the marriage relationship. And so, Lord, we commit uh, your word to each of our hearts, Lord, as we ask for your blessing this day, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Let's just sing the chorus of the love of God. to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever amen amen may God bless you all